I have a phobia of speaking in public. When I was young, it was so severe, I could hardly control my body. Now I didn't pee myself or anything. But that little part of my brain that triggered fight or flight was on full alert. Without any fire, earthquake, or any imminent danger, my brain was telling my body to prepare for the worst. In the middle school I went to, all students were required to do an annual speech. It was called civic oration. Now aside from the few that had to give the speech in, in front of the entire student body, all we had to do is give our speech in front of our own class. <laughs> it's easy. <laughs> I studied hard. I did everything I could, but my heart would pound just thinking about it. It was hard to breathe. Well, I counted the days and the weeks until I'd have to give that speech. <sighs> Three weeks, two, one, and then it was here. It was time. Well, I made a decision. I knew what I had to do. I stayed home sick. <laughs> I was really good at it. I developed the skill of taking a thermometer, putting it against the nightlight in my room. And it had to be just right. On one occasion in my early attempts, it did register 108 degrees. <laughs> Well, my mom, being a logical person, she took a look at it and gave it that confused look that moms give, and she threw it away. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, I had been running around my room, so my face was hot and red, and so I was, I was home free and homesick. <laughs> and being home from school was heaven. No brothers, no sisters, just a quiet house, me and my music. And I rocked. <laughs> no, not actually. <laughs> I rocked. It's what some people do, usually people within the high functioning autism spectrum. But my understanding of autism was to come way later. Anyway, after several days had passed, my mom decided I should probably try to go back to school. Or she was just tired of having me around the house expecting room service. <laughs> well, I did, of course, expect room service. <laughs> but I also went back to school, which I figured was OK, because I, I thought that most of the students would be done. And this is how it worked. So in the classroom, at the end of the day, at the, after the, the last break, students would file into the classroom, and they would be chosen in the order in which they were seated. So I could make a plan. My plan, sidle into the classroom, hoping not to be seen, and sit very low in my seat. <laughs> it was a good plan. Teachers scan the room in that ominous way teachers do. And she chose from the last row. She chose from the last row. I was in the middle. <laughs> My row is done. <laughs> now, this didn't stop me from slouching as low as I could possibly slouch every time I heard her call another student's name. I'm not stupid. <laughs> I also repeated a phrase in my head, um, a mantra of sorts. Um, don't pick me, don't pick me, don't pick me, don't pick me. <laughs> don't pick me. <laughs> and before I knew it, class was over and the speeches were done. I did it. I wasn't chosen. Well, this worked so well, I did the very same thing the next year. I stayed homesick as long as I could. 
I snuck into the classroom, and it was looking good. <laughs> Sister Joan was about to choose the last person in the last row. I'm not kidding. And she did. And for the life of me, I'm not sure how it wasn't me. I'm not sure how that happened. Somehow, me not being seen. I mean, for one thing. <laughs> <laughs> but if I was going to say, if there was one thing, I would have to say Jedi mind trick. <laughs> Don't pick me. Don't pick me. <laughs> well, I really thought I was safe. I really did. And then I did the one thing a person like me should never do in circumstances like this. I sat up. <laughs> yep. Just then, Sister Joan's laser beam glare shot me right between the eyes, and she called my name. Now, right then, I knew something more certainly than I knew anything before in my life. I was going to die. <laughs> my heart would stop beating, and I'd fall to the ground in a puddle of civic oration. <sighs> I have no idea how I got up to the front of the class. I hid behind the podium, but my notes rattled so loudly no one could hear me speak. I stuttered, I stammered. I mixed up my notes beyond comprehension. No one knew what the hell I was talking about. <laughs> I didn't know what the hell I was talking about. My heart was pounding so hard. It felt, it felt like it was bruising my ribs. For all intents and purposes, I was voiceless. I knew it, and I didn't like it. I thought about this a lot when I was founding Encore Studio for the Performing Arts. Encore is a professional theater company for people with disabilities. I was 33 years old at the time and had lived quite a life since my civic oration days. <laughs> In my early college years, I received several scholarships for music, but I also, that's also when my career began working with people with disabilities. At the same time, I was also a professional musician playing in symphonies, playing jazz, and even working with professional theaters. Let's see what else. Um, I got married. I eventually earned an MBA, and oh, I welcome two amazing children into this world. <laughs> That's one of them. <laughs> Both within the autism spectrum. I, at the same time, I was also, I began um, creating, directing, writing, and producing theater for children on a small scale. My voice was weak, but my desire was very strong as was my anxiety and stress. Side note, my understanding of medications and therapies that could help me would come way later. Anyway, all these things drove me hard, maybe too hard. When it seemed like I couldn't take any more, I came out. I know. <laughs> While I wouldn't advise this for everyone here in the audience, it can be very powerful if you're still in the closet. Coming out risked everything, but it began to give me my voice. Being allowed to be the person you are does that. Now, prior to coming out, it was hard for me to be myself and show the world who I was and what I had to say. And I was great at hiding. I hid behind my academics, and I hid behind my music. What I discovered was that several people I was working with at the time 
shared these same traits. They both had autism. I was confused. I later discovered that people within the high functioning autism spectrum are often very advanced academically, but much less so socially. And this is a big deal. It's a really big deal. It's, and it's a, it's, a, it's a very important yardstick by which people measure. And um, sometimes it's the only one. And that was me. That is me. But this understanding didn't happen until I was in my early 30s and after more than a decade of working with people with disabilities. That said, it was always easy to see myself in them and them in me. In those first 12 years working with people with disabilities, I discovered a familiar silence. Where were the voices? And why was it a rarity for people with disabilities to speak for themselves, make their own choices, and truly have a say in the world they live in? Everyone has a voice. Everyone has a voice. And it seemed equally as rare for people, especially adults with disability, to be, to be depicted as they truly are, not caricatures and not children people. I know, it seems so obvious. <laughs> Insight comes at different times for different reasons. Coming out changed everything for me. No, not everything, but some really good stuff. But between my coming out and my children being diagnosed with high-functioning autism, Information was coming in from every angle. And what it seemed to come down to was two words, two simple words. And they've been batted about by goofballs like Socrates and Plato for, <laughs> since for, for that long. <laughs> Be, know thyself. Know thyself. I can tell you, for me, in my personal experience, it's been very, very powerful. As a transgendered person, before I came out, I survived by being an actor. All the world was a stage, and it was pure survival. 365 days a year, 24-7, I had to act out something I wasn't. And I think this can be said for some of the people I was supporting at the time. Many people were thought to live in their own world most were f felt to be dysfunctional, definitely idiosyncratic. So how does one take these means of, of just basic function and turn it into something influential? Well, theater. I've seen a lot of insight in my 15 years as Encore's director and as a resident playwright. The means of creating our theater has been as important to the audiences that see our work as it, is, as it has been to the actors playing the role. And that method is we write to the actor. Their stories, their sense of humor, their most effective means of communication, but most of all, we write to their highest ability. And the abilities of our repertory company is truly staggering. I could go on for hours, um, but I only have 18 minutes. <laughs> but to give a few examples, we have a young a, a woman who has been a veteran actor for a long time. She does have autism. She is blind. But she can memorize a script in just a few hours, and a big script in a few hours. She also has m perfect musical pitch. Another gentleman um, who is just utterly a genius. He doesn't know how to read, but he is by far the most verbally creative person I've ever met in my life. And as for insight, I guess there's nothing like acting out your life story for the world to see. It's cathartic. It's compelling. It's um, not only do our actors have their say, but they're applauded for it. The most common phrase I've heard in response to Encore Productions has been, 
that isn't what I expected. And it's an interesting phrase with several meanings. Very often, it's, uh, the audiences haven't expected the professionalism of, of our company. And it is. It's an incredibly professional in every way, shape, and form. And that surprises people. They also didn't expect the content, which is even more surprising and perhaps more unfortunate. And the content being life. Everything everyone experiences. Love, relationships, work, home, children, pets, drugs, alcohol, sex, abuse. There's a need for what we do, as there's an obvious and gaping hole in theatrical repertoire for people with disabilities. There are a few plays, but 99 times out of 100, it is actors without disabilities playing the roles. Few playwrights and even fewer producing theater companies hold up a mirror to what is becoming nearly 20% of our society. OK, maybe a funhouse mirror. <laughs> there are a few special stories, usually depicting the heroic or the cute, often focusing on pity and sympathy. But these aren't the people I know. The people I know aren't any more or less special than anyone else. They are, for a lack of a better word, people. One of the earliest full-scale productions that we did, the central, in the, the central character hated the word special. She despised it. She thought it was derogatory. She thought it was another word for easy target. Walk with a Vampire is based on a true story about a young woman who was in a very dangerous relationship with a young man who was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. She was a young woman with a cognitive disability. This young man not only was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, but he was off his medications and he was addicted to heroin. I know. It isn't pretty. And nearly every character in this play is flawed, but it's life, so it's sad, and it's funny, and it's, it's um, serious, and it's ridiculous. But it's life, so it's very honest and authentic. That character in that play, I can guarantee she would not appreciate pity or sympathy. Empathy, though, I think I think she'd be OK with empathy. Empathy is how we relate. Empathy is what we have in common. I'm a fan of empathy, not just for myself or my children or the people I work with or my friends, but for everyone. See, pity and sympathy seem to be more superficial. Empathy takes more work. Pity and sympathy get more donations, but empathy and understanding and compassion seem to go together. And this seems to be truly when voices are found and changed. I still have a lot of social anxiety, but I found my voice. I think if we can take the time to help others find theirs, there'll be no barriers. I've worked with Encore for more than 15 years, and I've learned more from them than any professor I've ever met. I've learned that people are people and that everyone has something to contribute. And if I do have any sort of genius, it's a genius of tenacity. And it's a genius I share with many of my fellow actors and the amazing staff of past and present that I've worked with. People are people. We're all human. And we all deserve a voice. Thank you. <laughs>